So, hello, I'm a new compiler developer. I work uh, for Hex Foundation for a month already. Uh, I'm here to briefly overview the changes in Hex since the last minor release, which was Hex 3.4. Mm. Some of you who already tried or even migrated to the Hex 4 may be already familiar with what I'm going to say. Um, who did? Who already use Hex 4? Raise your hand. That's almost half. Uh, for you, there will not be any shocking content, but stay with me because I'm going to reveal some uh, plans for the best X4. Uh, some changes I'm going to talk about uh, already were extensively covered um, in uh, the talks which uh, happened in uh, the past time <clears throat> on the past events or in the articles on the internet but uh, I'm still I'll try not to spend much time on such topics. So, as I said, uh, the last minor release was uh, Hex 3.4, and it was a long time ago, specifically over two and a half years passed since then. Um, many awesome features implemented in the development branch since then, and uh, meanwhile we've uh, got seven patch releases for the Hex 3.4 and the first preview release for Hex 4 uh, what happened uh, like a year and a half ago followed by four more preview releases and uh, two release candidates. Um, it was a long road to the Hex 4 and uh, we're almost there. With still have about 20 issues to solve before the final Hex 4 release, so um, hurry up to test your code against the latest uh, development Hex to, and uh, rep report any issues you have so that uh, the fixes get in, into the Hex 4 final release. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the community not only for the bug reports, but also for the passion to change Hex, uh, to push it forward. Uh, the Hex evolution repo is the great example of such a passion. There were, as far as I remember, 35 proposals submitted. Unfortunately, not all of them got accepted, but the, latest, the latest accepted. But the accepted proposals uh, are the great features to Hex. The latest, ex the latest accepted uh, and uh, already implemented in the language is uh, in line markup, yes, uh, by Uri Kahim. I think, I hope I spell it right. Uh, yes, here, there he is. Uh, the latest uh, um, markup uh, Literals open a way for all kind of domain-specific languages, but uh, first of all for XMLish UI declarations, of course, and I don't believe that was the main intention, intention behind the proposal. Another accepted and implemented proposal is inlining functions at call site by Vadim Dechenko. Uh, a simple and uh, a clean idea which greatly improved uh, programmers, programmers control over optimization and code size balance. Uh, and the most supported by the community, I guess, is arrow functions. Uh, without the strong will of the hex users, uh, we wouldn't have short lambdas yet. Uh, I think there was like uh, 50 thumbs up on the proposals on the proposal, which is unseen amount in a hex part of the GitHub. Uh, 
And don't forget about ongoing discussions in Hex Evolution uh, repository. Uh, those are really interesting proposals about uh, promises, polymorphic uh, these, and default type parameters. Uh, so we'll go check them after the summit. Okay, let's go to the changes and start with start with the syntax changes. Uh, we'll see what was added to Hex syntax to make it even greater. Uh, the first one is uh, function type syntax. The old function type was kind of uh, weird. Uh, Hex is a multi-paradigm language and always supported first class functions. Uh, but the syntax for function types is derived from a functional language and is uh, far less known in other paradigms. So the functional people would expect such syntax to support autocarrying, uh, which is not the case. And the non-functional people are just not familiar with the such syntax at all. Uh, for me personally, the major flaw of the old syntax is that I cannot specify argument names, uh, which makes me to annotate uh, function signatures with uh, long comments uh, <clears throat> uh, and descriptions for arguments. But now we have uh, the new function type syntax, which, by the way, also was uh, implemented uh, after the proposal, after the hex evolution proposal. Uh, this new syntax is uh, self-documenting and much easier to read. Uh, as you can see, the new syntax also follows the function declaration syntax. Uh, so it's more consistent this way and allows to specify arguments names. Um, in the old times, if you wanted to define a callback with uh, two, two arguments, uh, you specified two types, one for each argument. And uh, for the callbacks with one argument, you specified one type. But for the callback with the zero arguments, you still had to specify the one type. Uh, uh, but now it's so much better. And it's you, uh, it, the new syntax so much better suits this case because you don't need to specify any arguments at all. What's uh, related to multiple, uh, sorry, for optional arguments, it's the same as in the function declaration syntax again, just use a question mark. Uh, the only difference is that you cannot specify default values because in hex, default values are the part of a function body, not the function uh, declaration. And if you feel old school, you still can omit arguments names. I don't think you should do it. While we're at functions, let's talk about RO functions uh, or short lambdas, well known in other modern programming languages. Uh, we now get them as well. It's a short form of anonymous functions. Uh, this feature was requested for many years and finally it's here. Instead of return keyword, it uses the same thing arrow as the function type, so the arrow function declaration follows function type syntax. For, for one argument uh, functions, parentheses uh, around an argument are optional uh, to make short lambdas even shorter. It's uh, also possible to define argument types uh, just in a, like in a false syntax. Uh, because Sometimes you need it but because uh, type inference uh, does not always infer the type you want it to be. Um, multiple arguments is no problem too, but don't forget about parentheses. The only limitation for the short lambda syntax is that there is no way to explicitly define the return type of an arrow, arrow function. In, in case you need it, you use the you can use uh, the old uh, full, full syntax uh, with the function keyword or also if you have a uh, short, uh, 
function body, you can type hint it with a, with a check type syntax. Arrow functions uh, has, have no special representation in uh, hex syntax tree. It's parsed into the same structure as a file anonymous function declaration. Uh, as you can see, the return keyword is uh, implied by the thin arrow. This may lead to surprises if you forgot about it. Uh, for example, um, empty braces after the arrow don't mean empty function body. So, uh, it will be generated as a return of an empty anonymous object. Uh, final, final became a, key, a keyword in hex four. Finally, that means we don't need that colon anymore. As you can see on the left side, in uh, hex three we had to use a meta, but in hex four it's uh, it's a correct syntax. Uh, and final class, if you <coughs> We are not used to this feature. Final class means that the class cannot have descendants. Uh, the same goes for the final interface. You cannot extend the final interface with uh, another interface. And the final functions uh, forbid overriding that function in uh, subclasses. However, uh, since we are using hacks, uh, you can use a hack meta to ignore the final keyword and still extend a class or an interface or a method. But you should still think twice before doing that. I think final is, is for a purpose there. In hex three and before, to declare an optional field in anonymous structure with class notation, a special optional meta had to be used. Uh, now in hex4, instead of meta, one can prefix a field name with a question mark, just like uh, in a simple uh, syntax notation for an anonymous uh, structures. Um, NM abstract is also now a rightful syntax, uh, a rightful citizen of the hex type system. Instead of a meta, which I usually perceive as a hack or a workaround for the lack of syntax, it's now possible to use an enum keyword. <clears throat> the same thing happened for the extern meta. It existed since, I believe, hex2, and finally became a valid syntax uh, in hex4. Uh, the extern uh, function may be needed if uh, you want to be sure that uh, that function will not be generated and uh, Compile it code. Uh, sometimes uh, you declare an inline function, but in certain situation, compiler decides to cancel inlining. With the extern keyword, you can force compiler to inline anyway. Well, there is also this new type intersection syntax, which came as a replacement for the structure extending syntax. Uh, this new syntax uh, better reflects better what uh, the real meaning of uh, structure extension, I think, uh, ex of extending function uh, structures. Uh, it's basically a, a union of types, maybe. I'm not sure if it's the correct word, but still. Uh, also, the same uh, syntax with the and is used for type parameters, constraints, constraints instead of the old syntax, which I used to read at the beginning. I used to read uh, the old type constraints syntax as uh, T should be either type 1 or type 2. Uh, with the, the new syntax, it's much more clear that uh, T should be both type 1 and type 2. Uh, since x4, you can use empty square brackets uh, to declare an uh, empty map if uh, the expected type is a map. But if the type is left for type inference, then the square brackets will be typed as an array. <coughs> now, that's enough for syntax. Uh, because 
let's go to the features. Who cares about syntax? Let's let's start with the key value iterator syntax. The syntax uh, feature. I'm sorry. The syntax is a uh, simple as a key identifier followed by a value identifier with the thick arrow in between. Uh, to make it work, the collection should unify with a special key, va key value iterator or key value iterable structures, just like normal value iterators and iterables. That means uh, the compiler looks for a key value iterator uh, field on a collection, if it's an iterable, or for has next and, ha and uh, next fields, if it's an iterator. Uh, that means uh, oh, uh, the definition of key value iterator is just uh, type def to the ordinary iterator uh, over the anonym, over anonymous structures uh, with the key and the value fields. Uh, thanks to hex inlining capabilities, uh, in most cases, no actual objects will be allocated at runtime. Uh, Key value iterators are already, uh, are already inter integrated into some types uh, of the standard library. Right now it's uh, just string, map, and hex dynamic axis. We also have uh, array in progress of implementing the key value iterator. Uh, string key value iterator uh, gives char indices and uh, char codes. At those indices, it's like iterating over string length and retrieving char codes uh, with the char code add method of a string. Actual actual uh, character uh, may be obtained with the static method method uh, from char code of the string module. Uh, map key value iterators uh, emits uh, keys and values, obviously. Under the hood, it's implemented the same way as we used to iterate over map in hex3. It just uh, retrieves the co collection of keys and iterates over it, uh, getting a value for each key on an each loop step. Uh, dynamic axis, which uh, wraps an anonymous uh, objects, uh, iterates over fields, names, and values, and uh, under the hood it's implemented with a reflection. It gets uh, the collection of uh, field names with the reflect.fields, and then uh, retrieves the values of the fields on each step with the reflect.field. But this one, the new macro interpreter, is a, a game changer for macros. It's called eval and is already explained in details by blog posts on hex.org and in past Simon's videos. So here are just a few highlights. It runs multiple times faster than the macro interpreter in hex3. So if your project is macro heavy, uh, macro heavy I strongly recommend you migrate into hex4. Uh, personally, I had a project where macros took uh, about 20 seconds uh, to execute, but after switching uh, to the new interpreter, macro times dropped to just 5 seconds, so it's uh, 4 times faster for me. Uh, Eval supports interactive debugging. Uh, macro creators are not limited to trace debugging anymore, and that's great. Uh, and in addition to macros, Eval is a uh, use it in the compiler interpreter mode uh, and by the dash x mode which just execute the specified module uh, these uh, dash x previously used uh, neko as the target platform in hex3 uh, but now it's uh, it uses eval interpreter by the way it outperforms neko too oh uh, another bit is that um, if you run hex, the command hexlib run and library name, then uh, eval interpreter could be used uh, to execute this command uh, if your library has a, a file called run.hx in the root of your in the root of the library. 
one of the biggest changes in Hex4 is Unicode support. Uh, strings, uh, Hex string is uh, Unicode aware now on all targets. Well, uh, except Neko, uh, which, which uh, doesn't get much love nowadays. Uh, uh, Simon already covered this topic too in his talk in, on October Hex app session. So you may find it on hex.org hex .org in the video section. Uh, I'll just give a brief overview of the current state of Unicode in Hex. Um, full, Unicode, full Unicode support is implemented in uh, Lua, PHP, Python, and Eval targets. Other targets uh, stick with the uh, UTF-16. It's uh, JavaScript, c -sharp, Java, Flash, Hashlink, CPP. Uh, this, as you may know, UTF-16 uh, uses a fixed chart, fixed car, uh, chart width inside of a basic multilingual plane, which means uh, hex string has a consistent behavior inside of uh, BMP. Uh, unfortunately, Emojis are outside of BMP, and dealing with them may produce different results on uh, different targets. Because outside of uh, the basic multilingual plane, we still have two behaviors. Some targets uh, count such code points as uh, uh, one character, uh, one character, one byte length, one character length. The other targets uh, uh, gives us uh, two. Uh, but it's still better than the situation with uh, hex3, where we had like uh, one behavior per uh, the target. However, we have special iterators over Unicode code points uh, in, the standard, in the standard library. Uh, they have consistent behavior on all platforms, uh, which, and they don't depend on code point being inside or outside of the basic multilingual plane. It's uh, x.iterators.string iterator unicode and string key value iterator unicode. Whatever string you have, you will always get the same set of code points on all targets. Um, so we have uh, UTF-8 targets and uh, UTF-16 targets. But Unicode variants come with uh, uh, both Unicode variants come with uh, trade-offs. Uh, UTF-16 has uh, fixed char width of two bytes, which means fast char lookup by index, but only inside of a basic multilingual plane. UTF-8, UTF-8 on the other side is capable to correctly handle any characters but at the cost of uh, slower character lookup. <clears throat> uh, since uh, character size is not fixed, it's always required for the runtime platform to go through the string from the beginning to find the requested position of nth uh, character. So if you want to parse large strings, please keep in mind that Lua and PHP has slow random character access. Uh, while Python is Python supports uh, full Unicode full uh, uh, Unicode code points set, uh, it has a slightly different in in implementation of the string at runtime. Python um, has different implementations for ASCII strings, for strings with the uh, uh, the Unicode uh, characters inside of uh, BMP, uh, Python uses UTF-16, as far as I know. And uh, for the white characters with uh, three or more bytes, uh, Python switch, switches to UTF-32. <clears throat> so back to PHP and Lua. Uh, the slow random character access means that string API methods like uh, char add or substr may become a major performance issue if you use them a lot in your code. Also, string length is recalculated on every axis because on every axis 
runtime has to go through the whole string from the beginning to, to count code points. Eval target, while implementing UTF-8, has some uh, nice optimizations. Uh, internally, internally, it stores a flag, if, uh, if, which indicates if a string contains uh, Unicode characters. If uh, it's not, the string is interpreted as the, as the plain old SCI string. Uh, and there are no performance issues because Eval knows each character takes exactly one byte. Uh, and for Unicode strings, uh, random character access by index is optimized for sequential indexes. That means uh, that, for example, if you request a character at index 10, the position of the 10th character is cached uh, internally, and then for a character at index 20, you all don't have to go through, uh, from the beginning of the string, but instead it uh, counts code points from the 10th uh, code point. <clears throat> also, string length is uh, cached on eval, so it's uh, it's calculated for the first access and then uh, it's in, it instantly available for the all sequential requests. Another feature is uh, namespace at conditional flags. Uh, Hex4 introduced it, uh, and now you can organize your defines. For example, if you're cre creating a library or you want to separate your defines, uh, the defines of your application, to be made immediately aware where one or another define came from in the code. At the time of Hex3, dots in defines were transformed in the, uh, into underscores by the compiler. Uh, but now dots are kept as provided by a define. Uh, however, uh, due to implementation details, we need to surround such conditionals with uh, parentheses, uh, just like in that example. <clears throat> Otherwise, uh, the parser does not know if that is a part of a field access expression or a part of a conditional compilation flag. There is a, a reserved namespace called target. Uh, compiler uses it to define flags which describe a target and define target behavior in certain situations. Those, those flags are target name, which is GS or CPP or PHP or whatever. Um, the, the another, another is uh, target.utf16. Uh, it tells if a target su supports Unicode using UTF-16 implementation. Uh, Target.sys can be used uh, to check if it's a system target, which means uh, the sys package is available and you can perform file system or any other I.O. manipulations. Um, target um, there's also a target uh, static, which uh, indicates if it's a static target, uh, which means basic, ty basic types like in like int or float and uh, bool can't have a null value. Uh, target threaded is tells us if a target uh, supports threads. Metadata also got namespaces with a dot as a separator. There is uh, no reserved namespaces yet, but some can be reserved in the future. Uh, in hex4, we got read-only array in the standard, standard library. Sometimes uh, it's needed to expose an array in an API, API of your library or a module, but that array contains, contents, that array contents is um, crucial for the internals of a module. Read-only array allows to do it and uh, be sure the array contents will not be changed. As you can see, it's just an abstract over a normal array which uh, forwards only methods which can read the data of array. Another great feature is final fields and uh, variables. If final is uh, used instead of a uh, var key, uh, keyword, such field or variable cannot be reassigned. 
it does not mean that the object referenced by that field is immutable. And uh, that object is definitely not constant and uh, still can be modified. Uh, what final really means, it, uh, it, it's, uh, it protects uh, an identifier from being reassigned. Uh, as you see in an example, uh, if you store an array into a final variable, that array still can be changed by adding or removing items but it's no longer possible to store another array instance into that variable. Uh, as a bonus, final fields uh, are required to be initialized either immediately at the definition or in the constructor. Otherwise, uh, the compiler will emit an error. Now, the hashlink. It's a new target designed specially for hex. It brings a new virtual machine. Um, Compiling to the hashlink by code is fast, really fast, and provides nice performance at runtime. However, for the best performance, one can compile a hashlink targeted application to the C code. Mm. Nicholas gave multiple talks about hashlink and published a great blog post on hashlink internals. Go and check them at blog.hex.org. And the, in the video section of hex.org, you can find uh, quite a few talks given by Nicholas on the topic. And in case you hadn't visited the internet for, I don't know, the last couple of years, here are the titles utilizing hashlink technology. These became huge successes, uh, both sold about a million copies each. And uh, Dead Cells even became the best ga action game of the year. Now safety, that's a new interesting feature. Uh, you may... Okay, it's an it's a exper experimental feature still, uh, and it has quite a few issues with uh, false positives or missing checks. Uh, now safety checks that uh, uh, you will not uh, pass nullable values to the places which are not explicitly marked uh, as accepting null values. Uh, this feature is not turned on by default. It's opt-in and it's disabled by default. It, what it does, it does only at uh, compile time, so you get no runtime performance impact. Mm. It does not generate any additional code for you. Uh, it's, it can be enabled uh, per package or class or field, so you can uh, gradually migrate your application to the safe area. Uh, the special meta null safety can be used for this. Uh, with uh, the mode, optionally you can uh, specify the mode. I will talk about the modes uh, a bit later. Or the meta could be could be used for classes or fields. But, uh, and uh, there is also the special macro compiler argument, which can be used to uh, enable null safety for the whole package. Now the modes of null safety. We have implemented the strict mode, which may be annoying at some cases because, because you know, it's strict. Uh, sometimes you don't want it. Uh, another mode is loose mode. It's a default. I will uh, describe the differences later. Uh, the third one is not really a mode. It just uh, disables null safety. For example, if you enable it uh, null safety for a package and you want to exclude the single uh, type from null safety, you can annotate that, that type with a null safety meta and specify off as a mode. Now, what's the behavior of the null safety checker? Uh, in this safe method, uh, it is annotated with null safety, so it will be checked uh, by a null safety checker. Uh, as you can see, S is an optional argument, which means uh, it's type not really a string, but uh, instead it's a null of string. Uh, so the null safety checker 
will not allow you to invoke any methods on that string or uh, access the length field, uh, you will get the compile time error. Also, you won't be able to pass uh, that uh, the value of s to any place which is not uh, type. I'm oh, sorry, which is not type. Of which is not typed uh, explicitly as, as a place which accepts uh, null, null uh, values. Um, so to fix these, uh, this uh, method, you need to insert a, a check against the null. Uh, inside of this check, the compiler knows for sure that the S is can no longer be have a null value. So you can safely invoke methods or pass this value anywhere you want, and uh, you will not get any runtime null reference uh, exceptions. Because as you may know, it's one of the most uh, one of the most frequent errors in the program. And, and, uh, I don't know, once I did a search on GitHub and found uh, that over 11 million commits were dedicated to fixing null pointer errors. Uh, well, if you imagine it, that single commit take uh, a minute or two minutes, which is, I think is a, a lower estimate, it means that the tens of years of someone lives was spent to fix null pointer errors. <clears throat> so, uh, hex uh, transforms to the target platforms, transpiles, uh, which has null pointers. Well, if you have a variable which uh, references a string in this case, uh, you still have uh, null, you still can assign an L to that uh, variable. So the variable references an L now instead of uh, a valid uh, value. And at runtime, you get the, the target exceptions. And the, that exception will tell you that you have a null pointer reference. So also, null safety checker is aware of um, control flow. So if you if you uh, return from your method early, in case uh, the S is null, then the checker knows that S is uh, safe for the rest of the function body. Uh, also, if you throw an exception, in, if S is null, then you then checker also knows that S is safe after after that exception. Uh, now to the differences between uh, strict and loose mode. Uh, by default, the loose mode is used, but you can switch to the strict mode by specifying the strict uh, literal for null safety meta. Uh, it uh, makes sure you won't modify uh, the checked uh, fields or variables uh, between the check and the uh, access to that uh, variable. Like in this case, uh, there is a mutate call which could uh, reassign, uh, which could assign an L to the field. And then uh, field.charat is no longer safe. So the compiler will complain and emit uh, an error here. here. Uh, with the lose mode, uh, there is no such uh, check uh, performed. So even if there's any calls between uh, the check and the access, uh, which potentially may modify the checked uh, uh, subject, there won't be any errors. And by the way, this is the default behavior of the TypeScript too. <clears throat> Also, null safety makes sure you initialize your fields uh, right away or in the constructor, and you won't be you won't be allowed to invoke any not inline instance methods 
or pass uh, this anywhere until you initialize all your var fields. You can disable uh, this check for uh, certain fields with uh, the null safety off meta. But that's. There's also a detailed talk uh, available on uh, the video section of uh, hex.org where I. No, where I describe uh, null safety. Uh, initially, initially it was implemented as the compiler plugin. Uh, if you don't know, the hex compiler allows to implement plugins written in OCaml, but now null safety is uh, the part of the core compiler. The next feature is uh, ECMAScript 6 classes. And uh, it allows the uh, compiler to generate uh, the JavaScript uh, using um, ES6 classes instead of the old uh, uh, notation. This is pretty much all. Uh, you can enable this mode by specifying the define gs -es es 6 <coughs> Uh, now the call site inlining feature. I personally, I, uh, I like this feature very much. It provides better con co control over performance and code size balance. It's a simple and clean idea, but it's it's a really powerful feature. I already use it quite a lot in my project, uh, and uh, it's already used even in standard libraries. Uh, you can use it to, for example, inline some big functions in the performance critical uh, parts of your application while keeping those functions not inlineable in, in the other parts of the application. So the resulting uh, compiled code or binary will not be bloated. Uh, also, sometimes the uh, situation when you have two functions uh, doing almost the same the same things, except the the second function uh, does some a little some additional bit of uh, action, and you can just inline the first function in the second one and add that bit without any without any unnecessary function calls at runtime. <clears throat> Auto using types for types means that uh, now you can uh, attach a static extension to a type at the type declaration site, and then you don't have to use the uh, using uh, syntax construct uh, in the every module where you use the type. Uh, the fields of the static extension is are immediately immediately available everywhere uh, where you use the type. Uh, yeah, right now it it only supports enums, I guess, uh, but we are going to change it for the final release. Uh, th this feature resolved fields for abstracts uh, allows you to. Uh, kind of override field access to an abstract instances. instances. Uh, if you access a non-existent field and on an abstract, and that abstract has these methods, get and set, with the, with the meta op, op uh, which means uh, operators overload, uh, then uh, the the access to non-existent fields will be redirected to these methods. Uh, in hex4, we had uh, the special interface called dynamic. You, you was able to implement dynamic interface, and then you had to provide a special meta on a uh, a special uh, method on a class, uh, which called resolve, which behaved exactly like uh, these resolved fields for abstracts. But now this is uh, this dynamic interface is uh, restricted to only support the extant classes. So 
uh, this is the alternative for the old feature. Now, inline mark markup is another feature which was uh, implemented after the hex evolution proposal. Uh, it really, well, it may look like an XML, it really that is not treated by the compiler as an XML. So <clears throat> it's an experimental feature because the, there are some rough edges. For example, uh, as we discovered late, uh, lately, there are issues with the top level self closing tags. Uh, as I said, it's not treated as an XML by the compiler, but as it instead, it's compiled as the special meta called uh, markup followed by a string literal containing all the markup uh, you inserted in your code. Um, the restrictions to these mark markup, I don't know, uh, the, um, it has to contain opening and closing tags, but these tags, again, are not like XML tags. The opening tag has to contain only the ang opening angle bracket and uh, optionally uh, some uh, letters or numbers. You don't need to insert a closing angle bracket. And the closing tag has to be, well, the closing tag, like uh, in an XML. Uh, the, requ the requirement is that uh, every markup literal has to be processed by a macro. So if the, the markup meta is did survive the macro compilation step, uh, the compiler will complain and emit an error. <clears throat> For example, this is, is an implementation of a macro function which consumes the markup literals. As you can see, it just matches uh, the expression uh, to find a markup meta followed by the string, by the constant string, and then uh, returns whatever it thinks it should do on. <clears throat> uh, also, in line markup, as another example, you can use uh, it to embed uh, any arbitrary language like JavaScript here into your hex code and get some highlighting. Uh, highlighting, uh, unlike the untyped keyword, which also allows you uh, inline uh, JavaScript or any other target code. Uh, <clears throat> here's an example of how to process these literals. In this case, uh, the JS build macro uh, goes through the expression tree and uh, locate, locates uh, the markup meta followed by a string constant and then uh, transform it to the JS syntax code uh, call. This call is uh, then handled by the compiler. It's, it's, it's almost the same as uh, untyped JS. Enum values as default values for the arguments of the functions are now possible in uh, hex4. Uh, since, uh, as I said earlier, the default values of arguments are not the part of function declaration, uh, we can uh, insert the default value uh, into the function impl implementation like this. So you can use the enum constructors as the default values, but it's only allowed for the constructors without arguments. Uh, auto, uh, the another feature is the auto value for enum abstracts. Uh, in hex3, if you had a big, large uh, in, enum abstract, you had to manually, uh, manually type uh, values for each constructor, but now in hex4, they get 
automatically numbered. Uh, but if you have uh, manually numbered uh, a constructor somewhere in the middle, the next value uh, will be auto numbered started from the from your manual number. This also works for the string enum abstracts. The value will uh, uh, will match exactly the name of the variable. So what's next in the best hex four release? Uh, it's for example a, Jav, a JVM bytecode target. Uh, it's already a work in progress and it works quite well. The, benef the benefits are compilation speed. It's much faster than compiling through the current Java target. Uh, it uh, doesn't need you to install uh, JDK, so it doesn't need the Java compiler. Um, it provides a better performance at runtime, and uh, it doesn't have issues with the hex type parameters uh, being incompatible with the Java type parameters because those are slightly slight has have slightly different semantics, uh, and it makes possible interactive debugging, which uh, unfortunately not yet implemented, but I hope it will be at some point. Uh, another thing which we're going to do is coroutines. Uh, we're going to implement uh, a generic coroutines, which means there will no, will be no async await or yield uh, keywords, uh, but instead uh, those could be implemented as uh, the separate libraries or as modules in the standard library. <coughs> Also, those coroutines will be single-threaded, unlike in C# -sharp, where tasks could run in uh, separate threads. Uh, here, you, in in our implementation, you most likely will have to start threads manually if you want. Uh, the propo proposal draft is already available at this uh, link, so go ahead and participate in discussion. <clears throat> Another thing. Model level, func level functions, which also was uh, proposed in the hex evolution repo. The proposal is already merged, but not yet implemented. Uh, the feature will allow you to define uh, functions and uh, variables at the top level of a module. You won't need the, the class to have uh, functions or variables. Uh, and importing the, such, a mod, such a module will immediately make those uh, symbols uh, available at the imported area, uh, just like in the example. Um, <clears throat> the last thing I want to talk about, uh, not to talk about, just to mention, is that a synchronous system IP, we're going to implement it, no details yet, uh, except that it maybe will be based around promises. By the way, the X evolution proposal on promises is also online. Participate in the discussion too. And it's, I think that's, that is all. X is great. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? Yes? Yes, the old one still supported, and it doesn't emit any deprecation warnings, but we encourage you to use the new one. As obviously, at some point, we're willing to deprecate the old syntax. Yes? Yes? Yeah, some, sometimes uh, we have such uh, um, uh, such branches in, in the code, but some old syntaxes were completely removed. Just for example, uh, the, the the type intersection syntax came as the replacement 
for the old uh, anonymous structure extension syntax. Well, it was far away. Okay, I will not look for it anymore. So, most of the time, we'll, we are, we try to keep the old thing working. Sometimes adding deprecation warnings, but uh, in a certain situation, we just uh, disable the old behavior. Yes. Uh, I don't remember exactly, but I think it uh, it produces two defines. So the old style also works. Uh, run.hx is a special file name which uh, will be executed instead of the run.n. Okay, so you can do uh, run and library. I think yes. Oh, yeah, the. There's a special field in the hexlib JSON. I was not aware about that. <laughs> okay. Yes. It should be okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just try it. <laughs> so, no more questions? <laughs> Regarding what? Yes. Uh, as I said, uh, we, we have Oh, no, that's another case. Um, the final keyword is only applicable at the hex compilation context. What that means is that uh, deserialization happens at uh, the runtime, and it's mostly dynamic as far as I remember. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Then you probably should not use final. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> but if you if you want your variable to be final, if your field field should be final, why are you going to change it? Uh, Oh, okay, okay. Well, maybe inlining will help you. Well, I'm not sure, but you can try. At least it helps for the null safety checker. If the function you call is inlined in the constructor, you get... Oh, oh, now I understand. Yes. Uh, I think it's not possible now. If your uh, deserialization runs out of constructor, I don't think you can do it right now. What? Well, yes, you can you can uh, work around that with a reflection, but but reflection is bad. Like you know.
Uh, I, I think uh, you will get an uh, accept, uh, a compiler error in this case. In this case, yes. Yes. Yes, yes, I mentioned that, but I, I didn't say it bold, maybe, I don't know. My, my example mostly touched fields, so, yeah, sorry. What? Uh, unfortunately, I don't know that. Simon is not here, I think he knows this for sure. Ask him in a, on GitHub or I don't know. Huh? No, null checker is executed after the typing and optimization, uh, before the optimization case. Oh, you mean the final keyword? Yes, null checker, null checker uses it to be sure that even if uh, the object is mutated, the field is always the same as it's, uh, uh, it's a final field. More question? Yeah? Access support for some of these archives. For, for what? My toaster. I'm not sure. I think you... Uh, do, do, doesn't your toaster capable to run JavaScript already? I know. I think uh, we can do that with the hex already, but uh, it probably will require some tinkering on the workflow. One of our targets should certainly should be able to do that. Yes. Any more questions? No? Yes? Yes? Speak louder, please. Um, I think uh, I, they are already in the release candidate too. That is all. Thank you.